Hi there. In this talk, I'll tell you about Julia Syntax.gl, a new Julia compiler front end I've been working on. So why do we need to rewrite this part of the compiler? Uh, how does it work and what benefits does it bring already in the new implementation? I'll try and answer some of these questions. So first some motivation, why would we want to rewrite this part of the compiler? So on the left hand side here, you can see I've got a function with some syntax errors in it in a file. So if I include that, the default Julia parser will tell us um, that there's a syntax error, but it won't tell us a huge amount of information about where that is. So it says it's on line six, which is correct, but it doesn't say that it's this character here. Um, and if you have a long expression, um, maybe this goes over multiple lines, um, then it might only tell you that it's starting on line six um, and not give you further information about um, uh, exactly which line it was on. The lines can be wrong. Um, so we'd like to preserve a lot of character information, per character information about where errors come from. So let's enable Julia syntax to be used as the default um, parser within uh, the core of Julia. So that will make it available for in the include function and um, meta.parse and any other any other functionality which is required, um, where parsing is required. So now if we include this error, um, file with a syntax error, um, we can see we get a lot more information. So we've been told um, precisely which uh, character this is on, like a character 42 within this line. Um, and it's just gone and, and highlighted the area, the actual error occurs in. Um, and likewise, there's, it can handle multiple errors. So we've been told there's another error on the next line as well, line seven. Um, so that's quite good. Um, it this is it's not always this good um, in the current implementation, um, but basically it does know where exactly each piece of syntax comes from. So um, sort of working towards making it um, like good in all cases, I guess. Um, Oh, you can ignore this part down here, which is um, a little bit that we added by the Julia implementation, um, which we can't override um, with our library hooks. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of um, how much more precise we can be in reporting errors. So let's have a look at a quick, very quick kind of crude benchmark as well. So here we have um, a couple of little functions for just finding all the files in base and parsing them. So um, let's call parse base. I've already included these. Um, let's time that. So this is 0.6 seconds. Um, now if we disable Julia Syntax, so this is with the Julia Syntax parser. Now let's disable that and time it again. Um, yeah, so I've already run these before. Um, so you can see it's a lot slower with the default parser. Um, another thing to note here is that um, that uh, this some parts of this library aren't optimized yet. So the conversion to expr data structures are not optimized. So if we were to use the parser in Julia syntax, um, oops, uh, let me just include this file again. I think I've renamed that function. Um, oops. So um, if we were to parse um, base without conversion to expr um, and just leave it in the data structures of um, the Julia syntax parser, then it's a lot faster again. So like 4.4, around 4 seconds um, over 0.24, So this is 16 times faster. Um, I mean, this probably parsing isn't a major issue in terms of um, the pipeline, Julia compiler pipeline as a whole, in terms of the time taken, but it's always nice to have things faster. Okay, just to orient people who don't know much about the compiler, so the front end is the symbolic part of the compiler. Um, so it starts out with a, we start out with a string, which is the source code of um, the program. So let's look at this very simple string at show x plus y. Um, so in the parsing stage, we aim to recognize this um, the structure of this string and produce an expression tree data structure out of it. Um, so in this case, the tree would look roughly like this. 
Um, the front end then um, will do macro expansion, so that calls any user defined um, processing of these expression trees to produce other expression trees. In the case of show, it might look something like uh, we insert a call to the print line function uh, call with um, the name of the thing we're going to be printing and the value of that thing. Um, so this is also an expression. Uh, after that, there's lowering, which does a whole bunch of things. It does things like analyze the scope of variables. Um, it removes any fancy surface syntax uh, and kind of lowers it to more simple um, forms. Uh, and finally, it will linearize or um, remove the hierarchical structure of this tree and um, produce a, a series of statements basically with go-tos. Um, so this might look something like this, and that's a code info object. Um, so all of those parts are basically symbolic transformations of the source code. Uh, and then none of these things include uh, any type information. So that's going to um, occur in the next compiler, next stage of compilation, type inference and uh, optimization. So that'll be further down. Okay, so from now on, we're going to focus on just the parser. So we'd like the parser to be lossless. So what do, we, do I mean by that? Every character should be covered somehow in the syntax tree. That's what I mean. Uh, so that means we can precisely report errors um, because every piece of syntax in the tree uh, maps back to the source code. Um, it also means we can do things like reformat source code because things like comments are included. Also white space are included. Uh, in the data structure which is produced. So Julia's existing expert data structure can't really support this very neatly. Let's look at how it stores line numbers. So here I've got a little block of code in the multi-line statement. Um, so let's just parse that. So what we can see here is uh, that the comment has, is, doesn't really appear anywhere. Uh, let's print out the tree actually, the tree data structure for that. So you can see it in detail as well. Uh, so yeah, you can see that uh, the comment doesn't appear anywhere here. Um, another thing that we can see uh, is that uh, things like this V here the resulting data structure doesn't really have information about where that is, which line that was from, or which character it was in. Uh, all we have is a bunch of what we call line number nodes, one before each expression in this block. So yeah, the line or, or character information is fairly coarse grained here. And it's not really obvious how to make this better. Um, we could we could try and insert line number nodes in more places, but that would make expressions quite difficult to manipulate uh, and sort of difficult in, in macros to, to manipulate. So for lossless mapping of the source code, uh, we really want to, we need to track source location precisely in the parser. Um, we record that in some output data structure, and we need to also record syntax trivia things like white space and comments. We need to record those characters somehow in the output data structures. So what's a good data structure for lossless parsing? Well, other compiler writers have had this problem over the years. Uh, one early notable example was the Roslyn compiler team who were creating a new compiler for C-sharp back in, I forget exactly when, around the mid 2000s, I think. So they created this concept called the green tree. So there's a deep reason behind the name, um, which is that they were a, in a whiteboard session and they used a green pen. <laughs> so they also had another tree which overlays the green tree, uh, called, which they called a red tree, um, but we're not going to be talking about that today. Um, we're going to be interested in the green tree. So they were particularly interested in interactive tooling. Um, so they wanted to be able to parse code and show it in real time in the editor. Um, but they also wanted precise lossless source mapping so they could people could write things like code formatting tools and other things. Um, and they wanted the thread safe incremental update as well. So they designed their green tree to be um, to you make that easy. 
So the basic ideas in that were have been copied by various people um, at this point. So Rust Analyzer is a particularly great example uh, where they have uh, created well, they've created a good system, but they also have a very great dev docs. So if anyone's interested in reading about how they solve the problem, um, they have really good documentation about the internals of their system. So what exactly is a green tree? Let's look at a simple example. So it's a minimal lossless syntax tree which overlays the source text. Let's look at an example where we're parsing this source x plus y times z and a comment on the end. Okay, so a green tree for this, at least in the way I've designed it, um, is going to look like, so there's a call node for the plus. So that's going to take x. Now it's going to have some white space. So let's put white space Let's show the white space here as well. So that's also going to have white space here. Um, so a call tree for the for the plus, uh, a call node I should say, another bit of white space, and then we've got another call node for the multiply, the y and the z, and We've got the white space in here as well. Uh, and then finally, a little extra white space and the comment. So white space there and the comment. OK, so one very important thing, probably the most important thing to note about this um, type of lossless syntax tree is that we can reconstruct the original source text just by traversing the children in order. So if we traverse all the children, including these pieces of what we call syntax trivia, these um, the white space and comments, if we traverse that in order um, and concatenate all of the strings of those nodes, um, then we'll get the original source text back again. So we can also look over here, and uh, I've got an example of what this looks like for the current implementation in Julia syntax.jl uh, and you can see uh, well basically what I've written um, is represented there now uh, there is a slight difference in the way I've attached the white space uh, that's basically up to choice uh, you can shuffle the white space around however you like um, as long as you preserve this invariant that the the traversing the children um, will produce the original text so strict source ordering of the tree leaf nodes gives another gift. Uh, it implies that parsing can be done as a stream of events. So we'll see why this is so good, but let's just do a um, quick example of how this works. So the input to the, the stream input, so that's, um, is a list of tokens or an array of tokens. So we split up the input text into tokens uh, using tokenize.jl or a modified version of that. <clears throat> this just prevents the parser from having to look at um, quite so much input. So the input, let's just take an example where we have uh, very similar to the previous one, x times y plus z. And we'd like to parse that. So here's the input. Presuming there's some white white space present. So breaking that up into tokens, we've got input like that. So the parser as a stream or as a stream processing, a bit of code that does stream processing. Um, so it's going to come along and read that list of tokens as input. Um, so It'll start reading them. And these ones it's going to just sort of bump into the output as events. Um, but when it comes to here, it's going to notice that this needs to be 
this needs to be an internal node of the tree that we're trying to produce. So instead of just bumping the next token, we'll um, emit a, a span event. Now this will go into a separate array in practice, but um, you can imagine as a set of events which go out into an output array. Um, so then we'll just keep processing uh, tokens. So we'll have plus Z. Um, keep putting those into the output event list. And when we get to the end here, um, it will notice that we need to emit another span or another internal node of the tree. Now once you've got this list of events here, uh, you can go along and build a tree out of this list of events. So we'll end up with call um, x times y. Uh, we'll have some white space in here as well. Of course, uh, right, and then we'll and then we will uh, add on top of this call um, plus. Um, well, we can add the white space in, I suppose, and Z. So there's all the white space. Um, so yeah, we'll post process this uh, this stream events and produce a tree. Um, so credit, a lot of credit goes to uh, Rust Analyzer and the Rust parsing ecosystem for this general idea. Um, or potentially that came from somewhere else, but I'm not aware of it. I learned of it from, from Rust Analyzer. So why is the streaming abstraction so good? Uh, as we can see here, um, we've kind of split off the actual parsing and production of this a list of output events from the building of the, a particular tree data structure. So we can kind of uh, write the parser without any knowledge um, of the tree data structure we're interested in um, and produce various different trees from it. So that's one of the big benefits. Another benefit that we have is that uh, we decouple the handling of all this white space here from the actual parser, because um, we, um, we'll see, I guess, in a minute that um, we have this parse stream abstraction where we can extract input and put it into the output, and uh, the parser code itself can ignore the insignificant white space. So that's pretty good. <clears throat> um, a further benefit is that uh, we could go and reattach this white space. So for instance, if we had uh, a heuristic, say, say we had a comment in here, um, and uh, heuristically we would like to attach that, for instance, to this part of the tree, where we could go and move this over to here um, as part of this event list. So we would just move where the spans, uh, move the spans across white space, I guess. So we can do that before we build the tree, um, and that'll allow us to uh, heuristically attach uh, any syntax trivia to the tree without uh, having to hard code those rules into the parser itself. So in order to see how this works in practice, I'm going to show you an example parser um, written for simple expressions, which are going to handle. So we're just going to handle multiplication, addition, uh, and maybe brackets if we, uh, parentheses if we get to it. So the parser will uh, handle input and output through a parse stream type. And parse stream um, parse stream parse stream has uh, several functions associated with it, uh, but primarily we're going to be using peak, which will look at the next token bump. Uh, so that will look at token peak looks at tokens in the input bump transfers tokens from the input to the output, and uh, emit. Um, emit will produce one of these spans and position uh, records the position of uh, um, the start of a span basically. So let's look at some actual code. So here's the entry point to a little parser we've writing, we've, I've written here. Um, so this parse expression function takes a parse stream ps and it's going to parse expressions of the form a plus b, where a and b can be some sub-expressions. So first of all, we're going to mark the position in the output where we're at, or we'll um, record that position anyway. Then we'll parse a term. So that could be something 
like x times y, but it could just be a literal or something. We don't care about that right now. It's just uh, something with high precedence. So that'll be the a expression. Uh, then we will peak. If we're looking at a plus uh, an addition, then um, we need to bump that into the output. So that will transfer the, the addition into the output and any white space. Um, then we'll parse the b term, part of the expression. So since we did find an addition, uh, now we need to omit this interior node. Um, so that goes from the mark to the current position and it's a call uh, node. And because the plus is an infix position, we are adding the infix flag. Now, um, this is so that we can use call for both infix and um, normal function calls. And of course we need to keep terms every kind of child in source order. So we can't rearrange the order of any of these things. Okay, so parse term in standard kind of recursive descent parser fashion is going to parse things of form x times y and it looks exactly the same except that instead of causing parse term it will call parse atom. Parse atom in turn call um, just checks whether the next token is identifier or integer. If it is, it will bump those into the output. Otherwise, it emits an error at the current position. So that's kind of the overview of that. Let's include this and run it. So let's just go back to our good old expression from before. Um, we can see that it does what we expect. And if we use the opposite precedence or the opposite ordering, then we get the opposite uh, ordering of, well, the, the tree is still correct. Okay, and if we insert some stuff it doesn't know how to handle, um, then we will just get an error. And as before, it will tell us exactly where that error occurred. Now I'm quickly going to add in a chunk of code which parses parentheses here. So in parse atom here, uh, I've just added this chunk of code here. So if we have an opening parenthesis, um, then we'll bump that. Uh, that becomes trivia. So it's not really important to the tree. Um, but it is important to the order or the presence of or the ordering of the, uh, the nodes, I guess, in the output tree. So then we'll parse an expression which goes back up to our previous function we had um, recursively. And then we expect to see an output parenthesis, uh, a closing parenthesis, sorry. And uh, if we see one, we'll just bump that into the output. Otherwise, we get an error here. So let's include that and try parsing an expression with some parentheses in it. So indeed that works. So let's talk about uh, the status and the future of this project. So currently it parses all of base uh, as of Julia 1.8. Um, there's still a few failures left in the tests, so those need to be fixed up. Um, and I've been looking into parsing um, all of the general registry as well. Um, it can already hook up to the Julia runtime and there's some tools for building a sysimage if you'd like to do that. Um, and uh, there's lots of work to do still on making diagnostics better. So I've shown some of the better examples, but there's plenty of cases where uh, errors are kind of reported more than once and other things like that. So I'll probably be registering version 0.1 soon. So that's the status. Um, where do we think we're going with this? Uh, so I'd really like to get this into base soon, if possible. Uh, one bit of a problem there is that uh, Bootstrap is fairly tricky um, because currently Bootstrap relies on being able to parse Julia code before the runtime, the Julia runtime is actually uh, fully uh, initialized. Um, so we've got to sort that problem out. Uh, the other thing that's a major goal is to get this uh, working within the VS Code and other editor uh, language server ecosystem. So before I go, I should point out that this work was made possible um, as part of my work at Julia Computing. And um, so yeah, thanks for listening. And if you'd like to contribute, I'd be more than happy to have your pull requests. Bye.